All right. So good evening. Thanks to those of you who are listening in live and thanks to those of you who are watching the recording. I appreciate it. Uh, welcome to Holding Government Accountable. This is an iPolicy workshop series that I'm hosting. Uh, my name is Dr. Josh Franco. I'm a full-time uh, uh, faculty member at Cuyamaca Community College in East San Diego County. I'm really excited to bring this workshop to you. Uh, we've held it a couple of times now over the past two and a half years. And so this is the first time we're recording it and uh, quite excited to uh, bring this content to you uh, going forward. So let's go ahead and walk through um, our slides here. <clears throat> so about this workshop, uh, it's a workshop series that's focused on how individuals inside and outside of government can hold it accountable to the constitution, federal laws, uh, state laws, and regulations. Now this uh, series uh, consists of 16 30 minute workshops. And so during this spring 2020 term, uh, the workshops will be held every Wednesday from 7.30 p.m. And the workshops will be held via Zoom video conference. Now, this is our weekly schedule for this work, uh, workshop series. We'll start with student power and then local government, a semester in Sacramento or D.C., uh, the building, a.k.a. the California State Capitol, state boards and commissions, the Hill, what? There's a manual <laughs> and congressional oversight of U.S. foreign policy. After that, we'll take a break uh, for spring break, so there'll be no workshop, and then the last eight workshops uh, will focus on how you hold the president accountable, state government accountable, this idea of democratic accountability, the interaction between state and federal governments, uh, holding the state courts accountable, the federal courts accountable, local governments accountable, and then lastly, the absence of accountability. So that's our weekly schedule for this uh, spring 2020 term, and let's jump right in. And for those of you who are interested, uh, some of the news articles and other things are drawn primarily from these credible news sources of Politico, The Hill, Roll Call, Rough and Tumble, and the San Diego Union Tribune. So let's start with week one, student power. Now, learning objectives with this workshop uh, include the following. First is to define student power. Secondly, is to identify at least one opportunity to your student power on campus. And then lastly, is identify at least one opportunity to exercise your student power off campus. So what is student power? Well, student power is the social and political power inherently held by students. Uh, student individuals enrolled in K through 16 educational institutions like elementary school, high school, community college, four-year universities, and graduate schools. Now keep in mind that students represent the future, so they're a social force. And students uh, represent future vote voters, so they're also a political force. Now, when we think of students, most of the times um, we might underestimate their power, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a moment, but I really want to center this idea of student power, right? When you are uh, in the K-12, K-16 system, or even after that, if you're in uh, graduate school, say in a master's or PhD program, your voice is unique in our political system because you get to speak from experience of being a student. You get to speak from the the nexus of what is largely local, state, and federal regulations and laws that shape your educational experience. You're immediately impacted by every budget season that the state and the federal government goes through, uh, particularly the state budget, because most funding for education comes from the state government. And so if there's a good budget year, there should be more resources. And if it's a bad budget year, there'll be less resources. And obviously during this time of COVID uh, and entering into a post-COVID phase, um, decisions being made at the local and at the state level, both policy and budgetary will have an impact on you as a student. And so your power is really important to recognize and to know that it's both a social force because you can bring about these social conversations that uh, maybe past generations have overlooked, ignored, or otherwise haven't taken as a core to who they are. And you're also a political force because either you're a voter because you're over 18, say you're in college or university, or you're going to be a voter one day. You're going to be able to weigh in on these, uh, not just political candidates, but these policy issues that um, shape the dynamic of our uh, political system at the local, state, and at the federal level. So why is student power important? Well, first, student power is important because it's understudied, it's undervalued, and it's underestimated, quite frankly. Um, when people think of students like, oh, you know, they don't have this idea of what they believe in, or, uh, you know, they're still 
forming their thoughts and opinions about the world. But what I found over the past 15 years, uh, I think it's since I was a student, right, we have some pretty strong opinions and beliefs about the world. And then when we go through college and university, we start to kind of firm those up, maybe shape them in uh, more dramatic ways, given our life experiences. And as we grow older, we can think about our time in the past and how it's shaped and influenced our views, but knowing that the next generation of students is really going to be shaping the future that we're going to live in. So now that I'm a, <laughs> a decade plus, almost two decades removed from my, uh, say, high school and college days, um, I really value the student voice uh, and the student uh, views and the power that they hold. Now, uh, what's important here is that students have to become self-aware that they have this power, right? And once they do, they can unlock it and they can unlock it for others as well, right? Once you realize that, wait a minute, I can go to a school board and share with them my experience as a student, both the good, the bad, and the not so uh, pretty. And I can tell them how I feel about it and what I'd like them to do. That's power, right? Or if you feel like you can go to a city council and share with them that you're concerned about some transportation issues or some lighting issues or some homelessness issues or uh, crime issues or a lack of affordable housing. And at the very least, they have to listen to what you have to say for the two or three minutes you get a public comment. That's power, right? When you get to say that I'm going to uh, volunteer for a candidate's campaign, whether it's at the local level, at the state level, or at the federal level, that's having power, right? And so you unlock this power in a way that helps you realize that your voice matters in our political system. And arguably, you're one voice, right? But you're one of many who probably have a shared uh, view and perception of the world, and uh, really a vision of what you'd like to see for the future. So unlocking that power, the key to it is being aware that you have it to begin with. Keep in mind that the next generation is already here, right? And this is an article from the Pew Research Center entitled, Millennials Overtake Baby Boomers as America's Largest Generation. And I'll go ahead and read this uh, first paragraph in a, in a half. Um, Millennials have surpassed baby boomers as the nation's largest living adult generation, according to population estimates from the U.S. Census Bureau. As of July 1st, 2019, Millennials, whom we define as ages 23 to 38 in 2019, numbered 72.1 million individuals. And boomers, ages 55 to 73, numbered 71.6 million individuals. Generation X, these are the folks who are 39 to 54, numbered about 65 million, and is projected to pass the baby, uh, the boomers by 2028. Uh, the millennial generation to grow as young uh, immigrants expand its ranks and boomers whose generation were defined as the boom in U.S. births following World War II uh, are starting to um, uh, taper off. And so here you see on the right-hand side the projected population by generation. And that millennial generation by 2050 is going to be very, very significant, right? And a political force. At that point in our uh, local uh, state and national history, millennials will probably be occupying the White House. There'll be a majority in the U.S. Senate. There'll be a majority in the House of Representatives. There'll be a majority of legislators um, at the state level, and they'll be making decisions at the local level. And that's going to have a really dramatic effect on our political system because this generation, the millennials, have certainly different views and perspectives on a whole range of issues from things as, uh, as straightforward as uh, racial justice and equity to climate change and, um, and, and environmental racism uh, to other things like uh, views on healthcare and on work-life balance. So it's gonna be really fascinating to see that change and we're, right now we're in the middle of it. So as someone who was a part of the student power movement leadership back, when, back in my day and now as a professor, it's really exciting to see this next generation uh, come to and uh, start to take those reins of power and being able to be at the kind of front row of that experience, uh, I'm quite excited to uh, observe it over time. And I hope you as a student uh, are really thinking like, wow, like we're at the precipice, we're at the cusp of this generational change. And the answer is yes, we are. We're getting there slowly and surely. So what can you do on campus? Well, there's a couple of things you should think about. The first one is your associated student government, right? Your student body. So folks who like student body president, vice president, council members, uh, that's a, a kind of a uh, a normal or natural like go-to place to get involved in uh, campus politics. You also have your clubs and organizations, 
right? And each club and organization has their own governance structure. They probably have a president or a chairperson, uh, councils, board members uh, to help run the operations of the club and, you know, maintain its budget and uh, plan activities and events. At community colleges, there's this very unique experience that students can have, which is shared governance councils and committees. Basically, um, every institution uh, of higher education is run on a shared governance model. This is basically saying that uh, administrators, faculty, staff have voices in how the, the college or universities managed, run, uh, directed. Uh, students uh, have a place you know, like a seat at the table sometimes at universities, four-year institutions. Uh, at the community colleges, they also have a seat at the table, but at all the different tables that are available in making decisions from curriculum committee to uh, planning and budget uh, to uh, overseeing the larger efforts of the college through maybe a council or something of that nature. So shared governance councils and committees are a wonderful opportunity, and I'll unpack these uh, just in a moment. Lastly here, <clears throat> as an, a more concrete example, we have the Grossmont Cuyamaca Community College District, and they have a governing board. Uh, it uh, consists of five individuals who are elected from five different areas that cover the district of the colleges. And there's a student trustee who serves on, uh, on that role, one both for Cuyamaca and the sister campus of Grossmont College. That student trustee is the voice of students on the governing board. So say you have an issue or concern that you should talk with uh, your student trustee representative and let them know your ideas and your, your thoughts and you know see how they can translate um, your opinions on things into uh, raising a discussion at the governing board or even looking to change policies. I'm going to pack a couple of these just to get a better sense of it. So we have our Association of Government of Cuyamaca College uh, webpage here. And you'll see here, you know, here's their board members, how to get involved, um, the student clubs and organizations, their governing documents. So this is a uh, kind of go-to place to get involved. Uh, I myself was involved in student government for many years, both in high school, college, and university. And I enjoyed every minute of it, right? Being a representative of your peers is challenging, it's engaging, uh, but the, it's empowering to know that you have to speak for your peers in the places where uh, you represent them. Next, uh, we have uh, sh uh, shared governance councils and committees. And this should open to a, let's take a look here. Yes. So Cuyamaca College, as an example, has a shared governance handbook. And in this handbook, it describes the entities that help make up this participatory governance structure or system that we have at the college. So there's an introduction, background, um, you know, this overall structure like the governing board, the college president, the administrators, the academic senate. And what I really like to get to is these councils and committees. And part of the reason is that these are like where the, right? So there's a oft-mentioned uh, quote from a, uh, famous political scientists say that if you want to study a legislative institution, go study their committees because that's where the work happens, right? The details, the nuance, the debates uh, really is in those spaces. So as a couple of examples, uh, we have the curriculum committee. Uh, they're uh, responsible for any changes to courses, to programs, to associate degrees, to, to college-wide degrees, all have to be run through the, the curriculum committee to make sure that it's meeting uh, any federal, state, uh, local requirements, and that's going through the process of uh, basically thorough review so that, you know, nothing slips past anyone and, you know, they're developing the best uh, curriculum for the students. So we have those there and students are welcome to attend and we're slowly and surely changing it so that each council committee makes it very clear that students are welcome to serve on them as well. And lastly, we have the Grossmont Cuyamaca District, which I'll go ahead and open up their page here. And we'll see their governing board members. So these are uh, local officials who are elected uh, on a four-year cycle, and they represent the community in making these positions. And here we see our two student trustees at Cuyamaca College. It's uh, Mrs. Christy uh, McElgay as uh, Cuyamaca's uh, representative. So in addition to on-campus stuff, which I think is a natural place to get involved as a student, you know, it's there, it's local, um, you're already kind of immersed in the community because you're taking your classes, you're involved in clubs and organizations, but you also might be asking like, okay, what can I do off-campus, right? Well, there's a couple of things, I think, structural that you can think about, but also um, kind of beyond the ones I'll suggest here. So you have city uh, commissions, you have county commissions, and you have California and commissions. And each um, municipality in the state of California, 
has um, commissions that it govern itself. So it isn't just elected city council members who make decisions, but there's also these other entities within the city governance structure that you can play a role in and voice your ideas and, and, and uh, bring up your concerns. So here in the city of El Cajon, let me zoom in just a little bit to get a better image. They have the following commissions, uh, the Giuseppe Field Development Council, the Personnel Commission, the Planning Commission, the Public Safety Facility Financing Oversight Committee, <laughs> and the Veterans Commission. So let's go ahead up and pull the Veter Veterans Commission up and see what this is responsible for. So the commission is currently transitioning to a veterans coalition. Once established, the coalition will meet on a regular basis to discuss matters that are veteran and dependent related. For more information, please call this number. So it looks like there's a transition here in the, in the commission itself. I'll pull up another example of the planning commission. And so the planning commission uses the zoning ordinance, general plan, staff recommendations, public input, and its individual collective judgment to make decisions and or recommendations on various planning applications, such as rezoning, conditional use permits, and uh, variances, and tentative subdivision maps. So basically, before the city will approve building something or, or allowing a change so that would result in different buildings, it goes through the planning commission. Again, this is another part of the being uh, and exhaustive in studying, researching, and ultimately making better decisions. So we have commissions at the city level. Uh, we can also check out commissions at the county level. So we'll go, to, go ahead and open up the county's website. So what we see here is the county of San Diego's website. And let's go ahead and check out you know, their departments, which we'll see here, there's a whole range of them if you wanted to get involved about the government particularly. So let's go ahead and open up this uh, boards, commissions, and committees page. Let me zoom in a little bit, review. So I'll read this top part here. Actually, I like to use my voice feature, so let's try that out loud. Boards, commissions, and committees. County government includes those standing in special citizen boards, commissions, committees and task forces formed to advise the Board of Supervisors and county staff on issues and policy and to serve as links to the community. County committees are created as a result of state and federal legislation, agreements with public or private agencies and local needs. Boards, commissions and committees advise Board of Supervisors on issues relating to the welfare and quality of life in the county. They provide an interrelationship between the citizenry of the county and the government of the county. So that gives you a general introduction to the board's commissions of the county. So let's go ahead and take a look at uh, a list of them. And there's plenty of them. So let's start with some like <laughs> the Abandoned Vehicle Abatement Service Authority of San Diego. That's, that's interesting. Or the um, Behavioral Health Advisory Board of the county. Or the Citizens Law Enforcement Review Board. Or a couple more, we have the Giuseppe Field Development Council. And you might say that sounds familiar because there's also a similar one with the city of El Cajon. If not the same one, it's just the city will send representatives, the county will send representatives and the like. We also have a planning commission, which serves a similar function. And uh, this Tijuana River Watershed Advisory Panel uh, as well. So there's just a whole range of things that the county serves as a nexus for. And again, if you want to get involved, you can uh, fill out an application. Uh, I think the only standards you live in the county and that you had you have to be 18 or older, but they might have some positions that are for minors. Um, so something to check out. And this last one are California State Boards and Commissions. And I bring this up now because uh, I wasn't aware of these when I was a student and it would have been nice to know because say I wanted to go down that path. It's like, hey, I, I can apply for just, you know, I can ask for an appointment by the governor to serve on some county, uh, some uh, statewide board commission if I was interested in it. So let me go ahead and pull this up because I think it's pretty cool when you think about uh, the range of opportunities that exist. So I'll go ahead and, and click on this uh, board and commission monthly vacancy report. So for example, say you're interested in accounting, right? Well, there's a California board of accountancy and right now they have a vacancy for a licensee. Um, and so if say you wanna get into that field, well, this is the, the statewide body that's responsible for setting standards in your accounting field. So it's something to be, be aware of, or say you're interested in um, buildings, uh, building code, architecture, engineering. Well, there's a state building standards commission and they have right now vacancies for a contractor and a member of the public. 
and say you want to be involved in all that cool building code stuff, right? These are the standard, these are the state laws and regulations that determine what kind of buildings are built, you know, what are the requirements, say, for earthquake or fire, given uh, where it's located, um, you know, do new buildings have to have solar, things like that. This uh, commission will be a part of that process. So there's a whole range of uh, spaces for you to be involved with at the state level. Now, you might be asking, wait, so do I need to, like, be, you know, have master's degrees and 25 years of experience? No, like, you literally are a member of the public. <laughs> there's a the public, you say, I want to serve on it. Right. And part of your argument is I want to learn more about it. I want to offer kind of a fresh perspective by being able to ask uh, questions that maybe people don't ask anymore because they're so specialized. But if you have like this outsider perspective, it might help reimagine the work that we're doing or rethink the work that we're doing. So uh, don't shy away from considering these uh, statewide boards and commissions, even at an early age or early uh, part uh, of your uh, career. So with that, We'll go ahead and uh, wrap up the recording um, and we'll get to the discussion portion. I appreciate you taking the time to uh, listen in and, and watch this uh, uh, first of 16 workshops on holding government accountable. And I just really want to end with this, like students have power, right? And you develop that power now as you are a student, and then you can keep carrying the skills, knowledge, and abilities that you pick up in that experience as you move forward in life uh, in your in your career fields or in different job uh, placements or uh, different interests that you have. And just know that in the state of California, you have a very broad and diverse uh, governance structure and there's just plenty of opportunity you as a member of the public, for you as, a, as, as an engaged person to be involved and to sh have your voice heard and know that that's there for you to be a part of that process. So in other words, when people say, oh, you know, I don't have power, I'm just, a, I'm just a student. No, you have incredible power because you can start to learn about these things now and for the rest of your life, you know about it and you can share it with others, encourage others to get involved uh, and to know that your voice uh, is critical to the, to the governance, um, to the democratic system of political participation that we have in the state of California and, uh, and parts uh, farther. So with that, thanks for your time. We'll get to the discussion and have a great evening. Thank you.